thank you guys for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, this is my first webinar so i hope i, I can do it fine uh, what i will be telling you today is about uh, how the golgi apparatus the organelle that we have been studying for a lot of years in our lab uh, how it regulates sphingolipid biosynthesis uh, i should tell as a precaution first that our lab is not a sphingolipid lab we started working on it recently uh, we have been we are more a cell biology focused lab and uh, we came came about to studying sphingolipids because we were interested in understanding the glycosylation function of the golgi and sphingolipid glycosylation mainly happens in the golgi apparatus so we started working on sphingolipids and we had giovanni close by so we took all the reagents and systems from him so that's how it, the whole project came about uh, what i will be telling to you today is the role how the golgi apparatus is not just a placeholder of the enzymes of glycosylation or sphingolipid glycosylation but it can also actively regulate uh, regulate them to determine what kind of sphingolipid profile you have on the cell so i don't need to introduce sphingolipids to this audience uh, this is a, a kind of lipid with a sphingosin backbone and there are several modifications on the on the head it can be sphingomyelin or glycosphingolipids uh, if it is sugars uh, these sphingolipids are mostly present on the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane where they regulate several things particularly cell cellular cell signaling and if sphingolipids are impaired there are metabolism is impaired it leads to several genetic diseases so this just highlights the importance of sphingolipids in uh, human physiology as i told you before sphingolipid biosynthesis almost everything all happens in the golgi apparatus and uh, each cell produces typically a set of uh, sphingolipids uh, typical to the cell type but potentially the genome encodes for a lot of sphingolipids to be produced the more than hundreds of sphingolipids nevertheless each cell type uh, expresses only a, a small subset of these sphingolipids and in a particular amount given they are cell uh, signaling molecules their amount also plays a crucial role uh, the question we have asked here which i will be describing to you now is that uh, if whether what controls this specificity we all know that that uh, the expression of these enzymes in each cell type is different and so that plays a major part and other than that does the golgi apparatus where the enzymes are localized does it also regulate sphingolipid production this was the question that we asked so to answer this question we took this uh, hela cells because it's a very simple cell cell system and uh, giovanni who has uh, has worked on it for a long years and he know very much about the system so he gave us all his knowledge and uh, know how so we took this system the hela cells have a very simple sphingolipid biosynthetic pathway uh, it starts with the production of ceramide in the er then it is uh, transported to the golgi where it gets converted to sphingomyelin a part of it is also becomes glycosphingolipids by with, uh, starting with the addition of uh, glucose by glucosyl ceramide synthase glucosyl ceramide is formed which is then further processed to ending up as globocytes on gangliosides not very complex ones very simple ones so there are only three products of the system sphingomyelin gangliosides and globocytes so we started first looking at where the enzymes that make this there are about only five six enzymes so we wanted to see where they are localized in the golgi apparatus so uh, i hear some noise okay uh, so uh, when we started localizing it by electron microscopy we found there were at least three zones in the golgi apparatus as you know the golgi apparatus you would have known is is a stack of cisterna uh, it has two sides the one facing the endoplasmic reticulum is called the cis site on the opposite is obviously called the trans site and uh, when we look at the localization of the enzymes we found three zones one is the trans golgi network or tgn it is called where most of the sphingomyelin synthase one or sms1 which makes sphingomyelin is localized in this zone we found very little of the glycosphingolipid biosynthetic enzymes and below that is called what we call the trans golgi not the network but only golgi where most of the glycosphingolipid biosynthetic enzymes were localized and on the cis side and the er most of these enzymes were absent 
we know the ceramide synthesizing enzy enzymes are present in the ER and in the C1 and C2 cis side of the Golgi, very little GCS and GM3 synthase were present. Other than that, most of the enzymes are mostly present, glycos GSL biosynthetic enzymes are mostly present in the C3 and C4 or trans side of the Golgi. Uh, what we know about, about based on the published literature, how sphingoma, uh, uh, sphingolipid biosynthesis happens in the Golgi is that ceramide is made in the ER and from there it is transported to the TGN by CERT by, in a non-vesicular way where it gets converted to sphingomyelin. The rest of the ceramide which is not transported by this way is transported by classical vesicular transport to the Golgi apparatus in the Golgi where it gets converted to glycosphingolipids. So this is what we know about the sphingolipid biosynthesis in this system. Uh, we have a very easy assay to monitor sphingolipid production. We give a radioactive sphingos into cells and then see what are the products that are produced and they are produced in this this way, most of it gets converted to sphingomyelin. About 70% gets converted to sphingomyelin. About 25% of it is converted to uh, GSLs or glycosphingolipids. Among this 25% of glycosphingolipids, 5% is about uh, is, is gangliosite and 10% is globosides. So we have a quantitative way to measure uh, sphingolipid production in the cell. We have a way to look at where the enzymes are localized. So then we ask the first question. So what if we destroy this organization? What if we completely remove the Golgi? So there are ways that we know. Uh, we can overexpress certain mutant proteins called SAR1 and R1 GTP. I wouldn't go into the details of them, but what I can say is that if you overexpress these mutant proteins, the Golgi organization is destroyed. In one case, all the enzymes are brought back to the ER. So there is a continuous single organelle now. It's not a staggered uh, organization like we saw before. Or you can add a drug called Brufeldinia, which also brings back to the Golgi to the endoplasmic reticulum. Now it is a single compartment, not three different compartments as we saw before. Now we, we studied what happens to uh, glycosphingolipid production under these conditions. What we found was that in control, as I told you, 70% becomes sphingomyelin and 25% becomes glycosphingolipids. When you destroy the organization of the Golgi, this fraction changed. Uh, now about only 40 to 50 percent was sphingomyelin and glycosphingolipids almost doubled. It went from say in some cases it went from say 25 percent to almost 50 percent. So this can be easily represented instead of this complicated plot it can be easily represented as whole change in GSLs. In con from control it, it in all three cases it increased. Glycosphingolipids increased. We also found under these conditions that cells tend to produce more gangliosides than globocytes. So GM to GB ratio also increased in these cells. So what we conclude from this very simple and very crude experiment is that the, the organization of the Golgi into compartments is necessary to produce a certain quantity of sphingolipids. It doesn't change the type of sphingolipid that are produced, but the amount is changed. So, so the, the next question obviously is how, how was this compartmentalization of the enzymes achieved? And how does it actually influence the glycosylation of sphingolipids? So this is what we addressed. The first question we went was how is this compartmentalization achieved? For this, we wanted to identify the molecular basis of this compartmentalization. So what we did was a siRNA screen of several molecules of the, which are localized to the Golgi and are known to, known to be important in organizing the Golgi structure and or compartmentalization. So we knocked each one of them and looked for what it leads to as a change in uh, GSL. What we found was knocking down one protein called GRAS55, increased the production of GSLs, very similar to what happens if you, if you destroy the organization of the Golgi. So we thought of focusing on this particular molecule, GRAS55. Uh, GRAS55 is a molecule that is localized in the middle of the Golgi, which is called the medial Golgi. This is the Golgi apparatus, and this is the cis side of the Golgi, and this is the trans side. Uh, we can identify it morphologically, though it is not very clean here. Uh, the, this GRAS55 is present in the middle. Uh, and it is a molecule, well-studied molecule. It has two PDZ binding domains uh, in the PDZ domains in the N terminus, followed by a, ser a serine proline rich domain in the C terminus. So uh, to understand how GRAS55 does it, so we made uh, using CRISPR-Cas 
Cas9 knockout cell lines, we prepared three independent clones of HeLa. All three clones showed an increased production of glycosphingolipids. And when you overexpress GRAS55 in these clones, the production of glycosphingolipids was reduced, saying that the effect on glycosphingolipids is very specific to the absence of, uh, of, of GRAS55. And we also find in at least two of these clones, GMGB ratio also changed. There is more glyco uh, gangliosides than globocytes. We also confirmed the same increased uh, glycosphingolipids by mass spectrometry. There were about two, three, four, four, four more production uh, levels of uh, GB3 in uh, these knockout, uh, knockout cells. So how does GRAS55 regulate this GSL output? No? This is what we asked next. So we looked at several things. First, we looked at whether cert mediated transport of, uh, of ceramide was functioning well in these cells. First, we looked at the dynamics of CERT itself. CERT is a molecule that binds to the Golgi and then comes off, cycles between Golgi and cytoplasm. The cycling was not changed. The dynamics of the protein was not changed in this condition. The transport of ceramide to the Golgi was also was not changed. The levels of the enzymes, there was no coherent change among these clones. So we then we looked at the localization. So here, uh, here we looked at the intra-Golgi localization of the proteins. Uh, as I told you, Golgi has two poles. One is the cis pole, which is marked by the red color here, and the trans pole marked by the blue. Uh, this is how the protein, uh, we can actually see the cis and trans poles of the Golgi, and the green here represents the enzymes. So uh, here, as you can see, the green is mostly overlapping with the blue, and in the knockout condition, it comes to the red side. That means it moves from the trans side of the Golgi to the, to the cis side of the Golgi, we can quantitate it and give, give a number to it. This is what we represent here. So this, this is the trans side of the Golgi and this is the cis side of the Golgi. Two enzymes in particular, GCS and LCS, which is present here, the glucosyl ceramide synthase and lactosyl ceramide synthase. As you notice, both of these enzymes are present in the bifurcating areas of the sphingolipid biosynthetic pathway. Both of them move from the trans side of the Golgi, which is control cells shown in black here, to the cis side of the Golgi, from black to the, the red is the cis side of the Golgi, while other enzymes like SMS1 or GB3 synthase or GM3 synthase were not changed. So we also confirmed this by electron microscopy. Here, uh, this is the quantitation of the presence of the enzyme in each cistern of the Golgi. C1 is the cis side of the Golgi and C4 is the trans side. You can see in the control cells, GCS is mostly present on the trans side. Uh, um, when we knock, knock down in all three clones, it is now equally distributed across the Golgi stack, or in some cases, it is also more in the cis side of the Golgi. While lactosyl ceramide synthase, though it moves from C4 to C3, it doesn't redistribute strongly as GCS does, but still it moves towards in the direction of the cis side of the Golgi. Okay, now we know that in the absence of GRAS55, the localization of the enzyme is changed. So, so this is what I summarize here. The GRAS55 regulates GSL biosynthesis. In the absence of GRAS55, there is an increased production of glycosphingolipids. And GRAS55 regulates the intra-Golgi localization of these two enzymes specifically, GCS and LCS, from the trans to the cis side of the Golgi. So we wanted to see how exactly it does it. So we looked whether GRAS55 interacts with these enzymes. Here we did the IP, co-IP, we find GRAS50, uh, this is the control, uh, non-specific antibody. As you can see, uh, GCS and LCS are immunoprecipitated with GRAS55, while the control antibody doesn't bring them down. Uh, we couldn't find any specific interaction of GM3S or GB3S with this, uh, with GRAS55. Uh, GRAS55 and uh, LCS have a certain structure. GCS is a multi transmembrane domain protein with a C terminus in the cytosol, and lactosyl ceramide is a type 2 membrane protein with an N terminal cytosolic tail. Once we find that these two enzymes interact, we wanted to see whether this interaction is direct. So, what we did was that we, we chemically synthesized the cytosolic tail of these enzymes and see whether it can interact with GRAS, GRAS 65, uh, 55. So, we find that. GCS interacts very strongly with GRAS55, while LCS interacts only very weakly. So we don't know whether LCS interaction is direct or indirect right now, but GCS is most, most likely to be direct. <clears throat> so, uh, 
And we also found while studying GCS uh, structure, we found the C terminus of GCS has uh, three amino acids, LDV, which is uh, leucine, aspartic acid, and valine, which is a typical uh, hydrophobic, X hydrophobic motif that binds to PDZ domains. As I told you, GRAS55 has an N-terminal PDZ domain. So we thought GCS is very likely to interact with this PDZ domain. So what we did was we purified, uh, we expressed in the bacteria the purified PDZ domain or this SPR domain separately as a GSG tag fusion proteins. And we tried to see whether it interacts with chemically synthesized GCS. So this is the GCS wild type tail. As you can see, it interacts with the GRASP domain. GRASP domain is the PDZ domain, N-terminal PDZ domain. It interacts strongly with that, but it doesn't interact with the SPR domain or with GST. Well, if we remove this last three amino acids, which are necessary for this interaction, this interaction with the PDZ domain is lost. So what we conclude is that GCS is present on the Golgi apparatus and its C-terminal binds to the GRAS55 PDZ domain. And this interaction we find is necessary for its localization because if you mutate these three amino acids in GCS, it is not present in the trans Golgi anymore. It is present in the cis Golgi. Like what happens if you mutate, uh, if you remove GRAS55 from the cells. So what we can say is that uh, GRAS55 and GCS interact and this is necessary to keep the, keep, uh, keep the enzyme in the right position. But how does it do it? So here I will, I will uh, enter into a little bit of cell biology. Uh, this is the typical cartoon of the Golgi apparatus. And the Golgi enzymes are not fixed in the cisterna, but they are very dynamic. They keep moving through the Golgi. They are brought back by this peri-Golgi vesicles. These vesicles which are on the side of the Golgi, they bring these vesicles, bring these enzymes back, and then they move forward. They, so they keep circling between, within the Golgi. So, uh, so what we thought was whether this cyc cycling is lost in the, or, or impaired in grass 55 knockdown. So what we looked was for the presence of these enzymes in these vesicles. What we found was that if you remove grass 55, both LCS as well as GCS were, were present more in these vesicles compared to the normal condition. So what do we conclude from this? Is that uh, this is the normal model of how the enzyme is localized comes back, as I told you, it comes back through the vesicles to the next cisterna, and then it is it goes back forward again. So it keeps cycling. We think that GRAS55 acts at this stage and prevents it from entering further into vesicles. So if we remove GRAS55, it goes again into vesicles and goes to the cis side of the Golgi. So when you remove GRAS55, the enzyme moves from normally translocalization to the cis Golgi localization. So this is, this is just to say how the uh, translocation of this enzyme from one side of the Golgi to the other takes place. So to, to conclude, to summarize what we have till now, GRAS55 regulates intra-Golgi localization of these two enzymes by binding to these enzymes and preventing their entry into peri-Golgi vesicles. So this is all good for the cell biology part, but coming to the sphingolipid biosynthetic part, we have two things that are happening when we remove GRAS55. One is the enzymes move from the trans to the cis site. On the other hand, there is a increased production of glycosphingolipids. While these two are uh, related, they both, are, they both happen when GRAS55 is removed. It is not clear whether they have a causal relation, whether this change in localization is what is leading to a change in glycosphingolipid production. So to check this, what we did was that, uh, this is what happens, as I told you, this control cells, in the, in the all three clones, there is increased production of glycosphingolipids. So what we did was we destroyed. If Golgi organization is necessary to produce this change, what happens if you destroy this organization? We, so we added BFA to cells. So as I told you before, this is a drug that, uh, that makes the Golgi fuse with the ER. So there is no more compartmentalized organization. When we do this, as you see, there is no more difference between control and knockout cell lines, they all they are same. So this shows that the localization is playing a role. So to get a more direct proof of this, what we did was we took this mutant that I told you, Delta 3C mutant, which is more on the cis side of the Golgi. 
So we took cells and we over expressed this mutant without touching GRAS55. As, and we also had mutants that were present more in the ER. So this is more cis, even more cis uh, into the early part of the secretory pathway. As you can see, as the enzyme moves from the trans Golgi to the cis Golgi, there is an increased production of glycosphingolipids. And this increase is lost if you add BFA that destroys the organization. This gave us a direct proof that the change in localization of this enzyme is what is causing the change in sphingolipid production or increased glycosphingolipid production. And uh, we also had a mutant of LCS, uh, which was more towards the cis side. Uh, when we overexpress this mutant in the cells, we also increase GM to GB ratio. So two aspects that are two changes in glycosphingolipids when we knock down uh, GRAS55, that is increased glycosphingolipid production and an increased GM-GB ratio can be reproduced just by moving the corresponding enzymes from the trans side to the cis side of the Golgi. Uh, so how does it actually happen? The, the way we imagine this happening is that, as I told you, this is normal cells. Uh, ceramide is transported by CERT to the TGN where it makes sphingomyelin and uh, glycosphingolipid production mostly happens on the trans side by uh, uh, which takes up the ceramide that is transported to the Golgi by vesicular transport. Now, if you move the glycogcs from the trans side to the cis side of the Golgi, it feeds in, uh, it moves away from sphingomyelin and it can, uh, it, can, it can feed into the ceramide pool without competition from sphingomyelin synthase. And so there is an increased production of uh, glycosphingolipids in these cells. So, uh, so Coming back to the questions we asked first, how was the compartmentalization of the enzymes achieved? We see GRAS55 controls the compartmentalization of two enzymes, GCS and LCS, by binding to them and preventing their entry into the perigolgi vesicles. And how does it influence glycosylation? We propose that GRAS55 mediated localization regulates access of the cargos to these enzymes. Cargos in this case is ceramide or, uh, or uh, glucosyl ceramide to these enzymes. And this access changes the sphingolipid output or what type of uh, the quantity of sphingolipids produced in a cell. So this happens in uh, HeLa cells. We can move the enzymes, we can change glycosphingolipids. We have, it's, it's fun to do this. But next question we asked was whether it has any physiological meaning. Does it have any, does it influence the cell physiology at all, this movement? Uh, what we learned from literature is that as the cells go from sparse to confluence condition, uh, there is a change in glycosphingolipids. So we try to see whether this happens. We cultured cells in different density. When the cells, what we found was that as cells go from sparse to confluent condition, there was a redu reduction in the uh, amount of glycosphingolipids produced. Uh, and uh, we also checked whether there is a change in enz uh, enzyme levels under these conditions. There was no change in the key enzymes, namely SMS1 or GCS, but there was an increase in GM2, GM1 synthase. It was al uh, already reported in literature, and we also find this increase. But the enzymes that is, in, that is necessary to increase the glycosphingolipids, the bifurcating step between SM, uh, sphingomyelin and, and, uh, and glucosyl ceramide, namely SMS1 or GCS, their levels were not increased. So we, we next did the classical thing that we, we have usually done. Took these cells and added BFA to these cells. So this is 25% or sparse condition, and this is confluence condition. You can see there is a reduction in glycosphingolipids, but when you add BFA, this change is gone. So the change in glycosphingolipids, which accompanies cell density, is due, likely due to the localization of these enzymes and not their expression levels. So next we took uh, GRAS55 knockout fibroblasts and saw what happens there when we cultured them in sparse versus confluence condition. While control fibroblast shows this change from high glycosphingolipids to low glycosphingolipids, this change was not seen in GRAS55 knockout fibroblast. So GRAS55 plays a role in this confluence induced change. We next looked at the localization of these enzymes in the control uh, fibroblast, what we found was that in the sparse condition, it was most in, in the sparse condition, it was on the cis side 
and in the confluence condition it went to the trans side of the golgi and this change in localization was not there in grass fructify knockout fibroblast where it was always present on the cis side uh, so next we saw okay as you know when the cells reach confluence they they should stop growing so we wanted to check whether grass fructify influences this it influences glycosphingolipid production does it also influence growth so when we did the edu incorporation this is a classical assay to see growth cell growth we find that after reaching confluence grass fructify knockout fibroblasts continue to grow more than wild type fibroblast and they also form foci uh, which is a classical assay to see whether uh, uh, whether the cell is responding to density contact inhibition of growth uh, wild type cells were responding to contact inhibition of growth by uh, grass fructify knockout fibroblast were less responsive to this so you can see more number of foci in grass fructify knockout fibroblast but if you block glycosphingolipid production in this fibroblast by adding pdmp this change was lost so what we see is that 55 is required for cell density dependent change in glycosylation of sphingolipids and this leads to a change in uh, contact inhibition of cells so this is the model we have the cells grow from sparse to confluent condition this somehow activates grass 55 we don't know how leads to a change in glycosphingolipid gcs localization and a change in glycosphingolipids which affects growth so this is what we conclude so to conclude the presentation what we know from this study is that localization of two enzymes gcs and lcs controls flux across gsl biosynthetic pathway the grass 55 plays a low, role in localization of these enzymes and the regulation of grass 55 controls enzyme enzyme localization which in turn controls cell density dependent production of gsls and cell growth so this is where we leave you uh, this is uh, it was interesting for us where we we say there is a role for golgi an active role in controlling glycosphingolipid production and most of this work was done by pratyush uh, my phd student so now it's open for discussion if you have any questions i'm open to answering it